Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody once again. And those of you joining us on television, we're in for another afternoon of four programs. And so we always like to remind especially newer uh, viewers that you're going to see the same faces in the same place for four weeks in a row if you're on the weekly program. And uh, if you're on a daily, of course, you'll see them every day. But uh, whatever, we're just so glad that all of you have come in. We've got folks here from Minnesota today. And uh, we've got several other new couples that haven't been with us before. But uh, we just thank every one of you for coming in for these taping afternoons. And then again, for those of you out on television, how we thank you for your support, your prayers, your letters, everything. And uh, especially your testimonies of how the Lord has opened your heart to not only the gospel, but to all the things that the Word just declares for us as believers. Now again, we're just going to go right in where we left off in our last program, even though for us in the studio it was a few weeks ago. We're going to jump right in at Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, we're ready to move on into verse 11. And uh, just for a little bit of review, for picking up the flow, we have been coming through those verses that dealt with uh, a portion of Scripture that has confused a lot of people. It is not a matter of being saved and lost and saved and lost, but for those who have deliberately scorned and turned their back, they have no more opportunity for forgiveness, which, of course, is applied primarily, because remember, this book is written to Hebrews, to Jewish people, who were not willing to let go of all the ramifications of the law. They had come far enough to recognize that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, but to step on into the doctrines of grace as we understand them, they were having a problem. And then for some, of course, they just deliberately turned their back on everything and went back into Judaism, and that's why the term was used, there is no further uh, repentance and uh, sacrifices and so forth. Then we came on and we saw that uh, in verse 10 where we left off that God is not unrighteous. He's never unfair and he will never forget the work of the believer in love. Now, uh, before I go any further, I guess I might as well point it out right now and uh, you can do this in your own Bible. You remember when we were back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the very last words of that chapter are, Now abideth faith, hope, and love. You all know that verse. These three. And the most, of course, is love. And then I made the point when we were teaching that, that if you'll watch all through Paul's epistles, you constantly see those three words popping up. Sometimes one at a time, maybe here and there, sometimes all three together. But here's another good example. Just look for it. And if you ha can't see it, underline them. Up here in verse 10, we have, He will never forget your work and labor of what? Love. And then you come down to verse 11, And to show diligence to the full assurance of what? Hope. And then you come all the way down to verse 12, That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith. There they are. And they just jump off the page if you're looking for them. Faith, hope, and love. See, And so these are little tidbits of Scripture that just uh, show us how intricately, and this is all I try to constantly emphasize as I teach, how intricately the whole book is put together. It's not just a bunch of stuff thrown in by various authors, as some people like to say, but it is divinely inspired. It has been divinely programmed so that everything fits. All right, so now let's just jump in on our study in this half hour in verse 11, where Paul writes to these Jewish people that we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now, of course, who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the beloved up in verse 9. He's not talking about those who had turned their back and went back into Judaism and became apostate, but he is talking now to the believing element, see? But beloved, we're, better, we're persuaded of better things of you. All right, so it's to those the believers that he says they have the full assurance of hope for how long? 
unto the end. Now we know eternity has no end, so in this case, he must be talking about what? Their sojourn on earth. And that God will never. Now, a, vo a verse always comes to mind, and a thought like that. Just back up a few pages to Philippians. Because even though Hebrews is written to Hebrews, never lose sight of the fact that the whole concept is the same as what Paul has written to us as Gentiles. And uh, in Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, same concept. Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, where he writes to us as Gentiles, being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you, in other words, he has brought us to the place of embracing our salvation, we know that we're saved, all right, and he that hath begun a good work in you will, now that's a promise, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will never let us go. He will never forget about us or let go of us. All right, so the same concept here, coming back to Hebrews 6, is even with these Jewish believers who had stepped right on into this same concept of Paul's gospel now, that they were full of the assurance of hope. Now, verse 12. Here is an admonition to these believers, as we pointed out in our last taping in those previous four programs, that they were to move on. They were to keep growing. They were to go on in grace and knowledge and unto a maturity and leave the elementary things in the behind. All right, verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who, faith, who through faith and patience inherit the what? The promises. Oh, the promises of God. Now, most of us are aware of the Old Testament promises given to Israel, which, of course, were all earthly promises, and they're still waiting for the good portion of it. But, you know, even for us in this church age or this age of grace, we, too, have a multitude of promises. And uh, Paul's letters are full of them. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that we have the assurance that we are His. Romans 8, that we're what? We're joint heirs with Christ. Well, those are promises that we can hang on to and know that they are ours. Now, when it comes to promises, as I've already said, the first place we normally go and think is the Old Testament. And so does Paul. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham. That's why we call that period of time in between Abraham and the giving of the law a time of promises. Because over and over, God promised the patriarchs, number one, to Abraham, that out of him would come a nation of people. That was a promise. Next chapter, that he would give them a geographical area of land. That was a promise. And then later on, as he comes to King David, he gives David the promise that out of him would come the royal family, which would bring forth the Messiah. Promises. And then all the promises concerning the coming kingdom, that age of peace and prosperity of which the nation of Israel has always longed. Promises. And so it's just to show us that when God makes promises, even though his wheels grind slowly, they grind surely. Okay, so read on in verse 13. So when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Now, you see, only God could do that. And so God can swear on the veracity of his own person that these things will come to pass. You know, I always tell people, don't ever give up on God just because things don't move as fast as we think they should. My land, how long did Abraham have to wait before he even got the first fulfillment of the promise of a son, Isaac? Almost 50 years, as far as we can determine. You can't put that in concrete because we don't know exactly how old he was when God spoke to him down in Ur. 
But we know he was 75 when he went from Haran down into Canaan. And we also know that he was 100 before Isaac was born. So it was somewhere between 25 and 50 years that Abraham patiently waited for the what? The promise of a son. Now, of course, we know in the, in the meantime, he took things into his own hands for a short spat of uh, weakened faith. But nevertheless, he came back and he waited until finally his wife Sarai brought forth Isaac. All right, so now then with that as a backdrop that God will never go back on his promises, this is what he told him. Verse 14, and God said, surely blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. Now always stop and think, what are we talking about? We're talking about one man who is already 75 years old, his legitimate wife is already 65, already past the normal age of expecting children, and then God makes them wait another 45, 50 years. And by that time, you think they would have totally given up. But you know, isn't that the way it works? You know, I always tell people when they say, well, why do we have to go through pressures and so forth before God ends? You know, I always use the comparison. I don't know how many of you like to eat the blue Concord grapes like I do. But the first thing I do when I put a blue conquer grape in my mouth is I squeeze out the pulp. You know what I'm talking about? And how that pulp in your mouth just pops out of the skin. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, all right. That's what I want. I want some heads nodding. All right, you know how I feel when God deals with me a lot of times? I feel like the pulp in that grape skin. He just squeezes me into the corner. Tighter and tighter. And I finally get to the place, God, aren't you ever going to hear me? And then, psh, there's the answer, see? And so this is what he did even with Abraham. He just squeezed him and squeezed him. And I suppose Abraham was almost destitute of thinking he could no way have a son by this 90-year-old wife. And what happened? The miracle of God, she had Isaac, see? And so this is what we have to constantly remember, that God will never go back on his promises. And that's what, of course, makes our Christian experience so exciting. All right, verse 15. So after he had, what? Patiently endured. And he obtained, what? The promise. There it came. 100 years old, his wife 90, and here came the promise. Up until that time, he must have agonized. How will a nation of people possibly come from me when there's no chance that my wife can have a child. But you see, Abraham, and a lot of times, just like we, we underestimate the power of God. But it came, and he got the promise. All right, verse 16. We're going to move through these a little more quickly. And so, for men verily swear by the greater. In other words, the more authority you can get backing you up, the better we like it, huh? I imagine if you deal with corporations, I've found that uh, you don't like to make the underlings uh, uh, angry and then like that. But I've found one thing. If you want to get something done, you go as far up the ladder as you possibly can. Even if you have to bypass a few people that won't like it. You go to the top if you want to get something done. And so this is the same way here. Why go to anything less than the God of creation? Because he is the greatest that can give a word of promise. All right, now then, the, the, two things that is, uh, the two things that are mentioned here, of course, are the two immutable witnesses, which would be his word and his oath. He not only spoke it, but he promised it. He put an oath on it. All right, so an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now the casual reader probably goes right over that. What does that really mean? Well, until you get somebody to sign on the dotted line, what is there still room for? Negotiation. But once you get them to sign on the dotted line, there's no more argument. That's what you signed. That's what you agreed. Well, that's what God has done. See, God has sworn it with an oath that these things are going to come to pass. And there's no room for argument. Oh, they can scoff all they want. The unbelieving world can ridicule it. But that doesn't take away the fact 
that the sovereign creator God is in total control. It's going to happen according to his timetable, and you can rest on it. See? All right. Verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, and he confirmed it with an oath that by two immutable things, that's what I just made mention of, that by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. And we might have a strong consolation. In other words, we can rest on these promises. I think for us today, for us today, the world is in a turmoil like I don't think it has ever been before. My, when I pick up my weekly news magazines and it's the Philippines, it's Indonesia, it's China, it's Taiwan, it's India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somaliland, Israel, you just go all around the globe and it's conflagration. Never have I seen it, at least in my lifetime, so completely global. Now, we know everything else is global. So are the problems, see? Now, the secular world out there doesn't have an answer for it. All they do is worry and lose sleep and wonder whether there's going to be another Enron tomorrow. They don't know. Well, we could care less because, you see, we haven't got all our money tied up in earthly stocks. We've got ours put up in heaven. And it's from there that we look for all of our final uh, returns, see? But here we have it, that since God cannot lie, He has given us all these promises that, yes, all the turmoil of the world has to happen. It doesn't surprise me. I hope it doesn't surprise you. Because out of all this, you see, the world is just getting set. The stage is getting prepared for the coming of the Antichrist. And oh, he's going to bring in a Zudo piece. He's going to bring in what they normally think the Messiah would bring. And so we know all these things are coming. And now, finish the verse. And so we are like those who have fled for refuge, safety, protection, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, not many people would even think it, I don't suppose. But when I saw that word refuge as I was preparing this, what was the first thing I thought of? What's the first thing you think of? The cities of refuge. The cities of refuge in Israel's history. Let's go back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 20. Now that's right after Deuteronomy, remember. And Joshua has now taken up the reins of leadership. And Israel is moving into the promised land. And uh, all the laws of civility are being laid upon the nation, how to get along with our neighbors, and uh, as well as all the spiritual ramifications of the law. But in the midst of all of their civil law was a unique one. And that was that Israel was to establish three cities of refuge on both sides of the Jordan Valley. Three between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, and three others between Jordan and the land to the east and up around the east side of Galilee. Now, these three cities of refuge then were just exactly that. They were a place where they could flee and be totally protected. Not everybody, but a unique circumstance. All right, let's look at it in Joshua 20. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say, Appoint out for you cities of refuge. Whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unaware and unwittingly. In other words, he has no... I always use the example, you know, there used to be a lot of hedgerows, I'm sure, in Europe, in the Middle East. And I could just picture this farmer cleaning the rocks off of his field, because after all, Israel has their share of rocks. And I can just see him cleaning the rocks off his field, and he probably just threw them over a hedgerow to get them off his field. And one of them happened to hit a bypasser on the head and killed him. Well, he had no intentions of killing anybody, never even entered his mind. 
But the fact remained, he had killed someone. So now what could he do? He could run to one of these cities of refuge, lest some avenger come and take advantage of him. Now that's the picture, see? Not anybody with any malice, no premeditation, but he has, without any knowledge of his own, killed someone unawares. All right, so that this person, verse 3, may flee to this place of refuge and be saved from the avenger of blood. All right, then it goes on to say that he can be there in total safety. No one can come into that city of refuge and try to arrest him or deal with him or anything else. The only thing is, of course, he's not going to get off all that easy. He has to stay in that city of refuge until the high priest of that present day dies. Then as soon as the high priest dies, then he is, of course, free to go back to his own uh, farm or whatever. Then uh, let's just drop all down to verse 6 so that you see where I'm coming from. Chapter 20, verse 6, And he shall dwell in that city, the city of your refuge, until he stand before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return, come into his own city, unto his own house, and unto the city from whence he had fled. Refuge. Refuge in a time of distinct need. Well, that's the first thing I think of when I see the word. And I'll even come back with me to uh, Hebrews again. So here we have that blessed hope that we too have been able to flee to the refuge that the Lord Jesus the Christ has made available. And we've entered into that refuge with our faith. All right. And then again, reading on in verse 18. So as we flee to that place of refuge, we lay hold upon the hope. There's that word again, faith, hope, and love. And now we can lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Oh, what is it? The promises of God. The promise of I just told a young man earlier this morning. Oh, the promises. He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us regardless of what may happen. He is always there, and He will never leave us. All right, let's move on again to the rest of the verse. Uh, and this hope then becomes a what? An anchor. An anchor. An anchor that is steadfast, immovable. And that anchor then is that which will permit us to enter into that which is behind or within the veil. Now, always stop and think as you read Hebrews, since Paul is dealing primarily with Jewish people, he uses all of his examples coming out of the Old Testament economy because they knew what he was talking about then. Now, when he spoke of going in within the veil, he was talking about that huge curtain across the temple, or earlier the tabernacle, that separated the front sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. You all know that. All right, now then he's telling us that we are now able to enter in within, behind that veil, into the very Holy of Holies, the presence of God, see? Now verse 20. I hope I can cover this in the remaining five minutes, four minutes. All right, whither? In other words, there behind the veil that every Jew understood hung there in the temple, that whither the forerunner is for us entered. Now I want you to underline that word forerunner. Forerunner. Because in the next chapter, in the next verse now, we're going to come back and pick up Melchizedek, the high priest of all, who Jesus personified when he went in behind the veil. Now, the word forerunner is a unique Greek word again, and it doesn't just mean that he went in and accomplished the work of the high priest, but when he went in as a forerunner, he opened the way for everyone that follows him. Now, what do I mean by that? Do you remember in an earlier chapter in Hebrews, 
Paul called Christ the uh, captain of our salvation. And I pointed out that again, that in the Greek, that word captain was really better translated a file leader. In other words, I think I've used the analogy. If you can think back when, when the, uh, when the uh, cavalry were still uh, working in the West, and I think we've all seen movies where the officer was up at the head of that line of horseback riding cavalry. What was that? That was a file of soldiers going to battle. And the leader was out in front. Well, now that's the way we can picture Christ. He is the captain of all of us who are following as believers. Now, as that captain of our salvation, he then has become the forerunner, or again the word implies, someone who is at the head of the line. And he has led the way in behind the veil. Now, what verse do you think of? Come back. Hope I got time. Come back. Here in Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 16. And these aren't empty words. This is because the captain of our salvation has been the forerunner who has taken us through the veil right into the Holy of Holies, whereby now, verse 16 of chapter 4, y'all got it? Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. See that? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Why? Because the forerunner has opened the way. He is the file leader whom we are following. And that takes us right into the throne room. Now, when the high priest of Israel, when he went in behind the veil, there was nothing like that. He had to come back out. And no one else would dare go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year. It was a closed room. But for us, the file leader has opened it up. The forerunner has gone ahead. And now we have complete access to God. We don't have to go through anyone else. Wherever we are, however we are, we can pray and know that he hears us. Okay, good place to stop. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.